Hi everyone, Steve here. Welcome to this issue of Monday Morning Musing. We are going to uh, continue on. I'm going to try to wrap up in the next couple of sessions, so they might go a little longer. What the Old Testament scriptures say about the nature of the soul. Just by way of review, remember that the average Christian has been influenced by Plato, and they think that the soul is an eternal entity. Uh, the, uh, Plato, Plato taught that the soul was pure, it was uncompounded, it was uh, indivisible, it was immaterial, and it was eternal. And we've been comparing what the Old Testament scripture actually says. We mentioned the word nefesh. And I just want to give you two nuggets to start off right, right off the bat regarding the, the word nefesh in the Hebrew. Both in the entire Jewish scripture, what Protestants call the Old Testament, and the entire New Testament, the adjective for eternal is never associated with either the Hebrew word for soul or the Greek word for soul. Now, just think about that for a minute. Never. And yet your average Christian would think that their soul is eternal. That should tell you something. That should tell you that there's an influence, and it's not coming from the Bible. It's coming from Plato. And just another little nugget in terms of, in, in, in our previous sessions, we showed that more than half the time that Hebrew word is not translated as soul as we would understand it. In the, 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 the book of Numbers itself, it's translated, just in one book, Nefesh is translated in 17 different ways. In one book of the Old Testament. We need to be a little better taught on this subject. I want to give you an example of how nuanced and how inconsistent translators can be with this, with this, with this issue. In Proverbs, there's a verse, I don't know where it is, it's Proverbs chapter 12, whatever, but it talks about a, a, a man taking care of the life of his beast, you know, be, being a custodian, be, treating it well, the life of his beast. The word that is translated as life is nefesh. Now, why don't they say soul of the beast? Well, that's because animals don't have souls. Only humans have souls, and only humans have or have eternal soul. It's the same exact word. But when it applies to an animal, well, we better translate it as life. Well, what if we need to dump the platonic influence entirely and understand that the word nefesh, like in Genesis 1.21 and in Genesis 1.30, it is translated as living creature. Living, a uh, soul means a living creature that has sensation. It moves from place to place. And that's important, again, for uh, considering platonic concepts of, of uh, soul being part of divinity that is unmovable. And the quality that supposedly uh, the, 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 the soul is this immovable, eternal, eternally existent, with no change, can't be sustained if you're going to translate it as life, because life is full of change. And animals and creatures change all the time, and they're, sub and, and they're subject to mobility. And even that passage in Genesis where it says, and they became a living soul, a living nefesh. When the, when the dust of the earth and the breath of God came together, he became a living soul. And the more accurate translation would be a living creature, a living being. Think about it. In that passage in Genesis where it says, you know, Adam became a living soul, it's not talking about some invisible thing that, that goes to heaven when you die. 
the soul to be a living creature is not confined specifically just to humanity. Animals are, have nefesh. They're living creatures. So, what goes to heaven when you die? Man, my soul goes to heaven. Hmm. I don't know about that. Humanity is described as a living soul when, now this is very important, when earthly material combines with the breath of God, a living creature. So the essence of what it means to be human is not platonic, that my true identity is in some invisible realm somewhere. No, the essence of my existence is my earthiness infused or imbued or in union with the breath of God. Now, there is no soul until the union. Earth, you're from earth, we're going back to earth, plus the breath of God makes a living soul. The soul is not something invisible that comes out of pre-time and pre-existing and comes into a body. We are made a living soul when the component parts come together. And I'll close this session with a fairly decent analogy, and knowing that every analogy has its limitations. So consider a watch. Consider all the parts that are in a watch. Now, one of the gears in the watch, if you take it out, it's not a watch. It's just a gear. And it's not really watch until it is in union with all the other pieces. And when all those other pieces come together and function together, we have a watch. Please listen to this. This is going to be very important later when we get to Paul's teaching on, the, on this spiritual body issue. The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. When we put a watch together, we don't just have a fine collection of gears and springs and cans. Something greater than all the individual parts now exist, and it's called a watch. And it's, that's the same perspective in the Hebrew Scriptures regarding the soul. The soul is greater than either of its parts. Stay with me. It's not just earth. And here's the where I differ with Plato. It's not just God. It's not just invisible things. We don't become a living soul until the two things come together. And the, and the uh, Hebrew Scriptures are full of examples, and I'm going to read them to you, of how a living soul behaves, or what are the qualities of a living soul. Souls are speaking of being created, having name. I'm, I'm just going to, I'm going to put in the soul in front of these. Souls move, souls eat, souls possess flesh and blood, souls can be killed, souls can be destroyed, souls can go to the grave, and, and they maintain a uh, relation to the body even in the, in the grave. Uh, souls uh, can be lost. But the good news is a soul, a living being, and this is important for New Testament doctrine, is not left in that state of, of, of uh, peril of lostness because a living soul Flesh and blood and the breath of God can be a candidate for resurrection. There's nothing more fundamental to the apostolic Christian message than the resurrection of the body. We are going to be resurrected in entirety. Not just my soul going to heaven, but as living beings who eat, suffer, can die, can be killed, we believe it's all going to be resurrected. 
And there are multitudes of passages in the Old Testament, hundreds of passages, where Nefesh lives, moves, suffers, eats, and an internal, invisible entity is not what the Old Testament teaches about what a soul is. See you next time.